Welcome to number two in the webinar series, 2D versus 3D. Um, as Ollie mentioned, I'm head of 3D at Escape Studios and course leader, and also the Houdini tutor. So this um, webinar I decided to do about some about Houdini. And as I'm sure most of you know, Houdini 18 has um, not long been out, and there's some very cool stuff going on in there. So today I thought I would have a quick look at the um, new pyro solver in SOPS and the uh, sparse solver, and just throw out some of the differences between the traditional pyro solver, and um, just some hopefully some tips along the way. Houdini 18 has not long been out, and uh, there's quite a new, quite a few new changes in it. Um, one of the particular interesting ones comes with the uh, pyro tools. These are sort of the traditional pyro tools here, but we now have um, these sparse tools. But not only that, um, it's also there's a, a difference in the way that Houdini is sort of um, letting you handle simulations. Let's create something and I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to start by creating uh, some geometry and I'm going to create a torus in there. And we'll make quite a, a large torus for this. So it's like six meters big. So this is a very large scale scene there. Remember, whenever you do sims, you have to deal with scene units. So this is six meters wide, like the size of a big chimney. I'm just going to stick a transform node in there and uh, make it a lot flatter. It doesn't matter too much, um, but I want a nice ring of uh, flames there. I'll just use the uh, shelf preset now. And what we'll do is we'll build it ourselves again in a moment. If I just use this new sparse um, shelf tool and I um, Actually, let me do that first. If I go to just do the traditional shelf tool first and do it flames, let me and hit enter. I just want to show you how it works first and then we can understand why the sparse is better. So when we run a traditional simulation using the standard shelf tools, um, we can see it run away and we can see the uh, voxel box is resizing here. That's one of the features of Houdini. And uh, as we know, this box is containing all the simulation and it's made up of a lot of little cubes called voxels which store the information. And uh, as you can see, it's not very efficient. Over here, there's some big empty areas in there, um, which is fine, but it can slow down your simulation and take up a lot of extra memory that you may or may not have. And um, this is where the solution of the spa, the, uh, the idea of the sparse solver comes in. First off, um, you, um, yeah, let's create a sparse solver with that. So I'm just going to delete these nodes and show you what the uh, sparse solver does when we create it. Now, when we traditionally uh, create the network, as you saw, Houdini created a whole bunch of nodes and it created a separate dot network and we imported the stuff in there. But um, with Houdini 16, they started to... Um, with the advent of Vellum, you're able to start to do solving outside of DOPS and all, all inside SOPS. And then in this version of Houdini, they've brought in more rigid body tools and the rigid body solver and also the pyro solver. So we can do most of the stuff in SOPS without really going into DOPS. It's just a high, um, an easier way of operating it. Still basically the same nodes, they've just packaged them up to make it easier. So let's have a look at that methodology and also we can talk about how sparse solving also fixes that voxel issue there. So I'm going to start, um, like all pyro sims, with a um, pyro source node. So we'll just drop that in. And what the pyro source node does is it allows us to create some points here. And these are going to be the seeds eventually for our simulation, where it's going to start from. So um, I'm, we need to create some attributes on these, though. If we have a look, there's only scale attribute. Um, so we need to create some for the simulation. Now, this node has some great presets. If you go into initialize, you can switch these around and you'll see it changes what you need down here. Now, this is actually set up for traditional um, pyro, not really the um, new one that you can run in SOP. So these are not that necessary. So that's what I'm going to show you, some of the tips, how you might change this so you can set it up easily in um, SOPs here. So first off, um, we are not using the fuel model. That's the first interesting thing about the, uh, the difference here is we're not using fuel that we uh, usually use in the um, traditional way of doing pyro in Houdini. So we can get rid of that. And we're also not going to use density. In fact, it doesn't have the one we need to use here. We're going to use a new one called flame. Um, flame will just dictate sort of the uh, brightness of it. That's similar to sort of um, the heat from the traditional pyro. So I just want to emit some flame. Actually, I'm going to call it burn. And... Um, if you, if you use the presets from the shelf, you'll see they call them burn, but they convert them to flame anyway. But we'll call it burn just to keep with that. It doesn't really matter what you call it. Um, 
but that's kind of your intensity. I'll show you how to wire that in in a moment. So we've created these two attributes, burn and temperature. So if we middle click, we can see that we've, we have those values there and here. And those values have a value of one because we're not scaling them. Uh, the other thing is you'll see I, I've got these rather nicely laid out. I don't really want to do that. So I'm just going to scatter on the surface, which gives me a nice randomness of the points here. And if I want to spread them out, I can increase the separation or decrease it to change how far they're separated along there. The next thing I want to do is actually uh, turn this into a volume because it's a volume that the pyro solver needs. So to do that, uh, we use a rasterize from attributes nodes. And what this does, it takes particular attributes and it rasterizes them into a volume. So you specify the attributes up here. We called it burn. And there we go, we can see a volume there. And we also want one for temperature. The burn tells us where it's gonna burn, where we produce the heat and the temperature will make it rise and control the uh, buoyancy and then we'll get velocities and other stuff which makes it look like fire. So these are the two minimum that we need and they'll produce density when it stops burning, which is effectively your smoke. That's why we don't really need the density from the beginning. So I'm just gonna turn on this normalized by clamp coverage, which just makes sure um, we're not getting any fluffy areas and it's more reli reliably fits our shape. And um, we can also, um, drop this voxel size down for the resolution there. Ooh. So this is uh, how coarse that representation is to your points there. Generally, you don't want a number too slow here, especially if it's animating, because as you, as you can see, it takes a while uh, to calculate. But um, I'm just going to pick a value like 0 0.05, just so I've got some nice detail on my points there. Now, um, if I was going to make some flame from this, this is basically the, um, you can think of it like the fuel. This is what's actually going to burn. This is the burn and the temperature. And if you can imagine flames, uh, a base of flames, they, they actually move around. They dance around at the base there. Um, so we want to add some noise to this. So I'm just going to add some attribute noise. And I'm going to do that before the rasterize here. This just varies some of the values in there. If you see, I've got it set to color at the minute. And we're getting random different colors on our points there. That might be a little bit difficult to see. So let me just increase the uh, point size. There we go. So you see they've got um, rainbow colors. I don't want to add noise to those values. I want to add noise to burn and temperature. And uh, these want to be a one-dimensional noise, not a three-dimensional noise, really. If we look in the uh, spreadsheet, we can see that the uh, temperature and the uh, burn have differing values here. We can see that they're all different. If we look in the rasterize, uh, we can't see much of an effect like that. But what I can do is I can just remap these values. So I'm just going to, um, first of all, remap the noise values. Let's have minus 1.7 and plus 1.7, which will clip stuff off. And you can see it's broken up that shape. If we turn on animated and put a pulse length of 0.2, let me just play that back. You'll see the noise now changes and evolves. And I'm trying to get something that's a similar frequency to the kind of thing that you see in the bottom of a flame bed. There's other things we can control. We can control the, di the uh, distribution here from this minimum value to the maximum value. So we can have it sort of fade in like this, which can give us more control over those edges. And we can also play with the element size here to break that up more. Let's have something like this. You'll see the flames will be kind of dancing around from these points there. That's kind of good for the minute. So half the secret to making good fire is getting a good uh, initial emission there. So um, I'm just going to add a null. So I know it's the end of my emission network here. Now here comes the fun bit. Normally we would go into, um, let me just save actually, just in case this crashes. So normally um, we would go into DOPS, take these, if we have a look, these volumes, burn and temperature into DOPS and we would do stuff with them. But now actually inside SOPS, we can type pyro and we've actually got a pyro solver node. If, let me just plug that in. And uh, the nice thing about the Pyro Solver node is you can just plug your um, stuff in there and press play and you'll start to get a sim. You didn't have to set up any dynamics or anything. As you might have guessed, if you dive inside, it is actually a dynamics network, but it's much more, much more easy to deal with. So if you don't need stuff really interacting a lot, just maybe a few colliders, and you want to do it quickly, this is an easy, quick way to set it up without doing a full-on DOP network. And we've got a lot of the features here on the node itself. 
So um, here we've got the boundary conditions. I'm just going to say um, close below so it won't resize below the ground there. So effectively clipping it off at the ground. I'm only going to get my half my torus because it was um, below the ground there. So we'll just lift that up above a little bit in height. And um, we have the resolution here. Now, the first thing you'll notice, um, it's not really working very well, um, but it kind of is. You want to check in your sourcing here that you're bringing in the right volumes. And you can see, actually, I am. Uh, this is set up to bring in density, burn, temperature, and velocity. We only created burn and temperature. And look, it's remapping this burn to this flame field. Um, now, you might be tempted to increase more um, temperature and stuff, but remember I said this model works slightly different to um, what we used to in DOPS, in a pyro in DOPS. So we can actually go to the solving tab here. The setup tab is just literally your container as per normal, things like the resolution here. Um, we can manage collisions there and boundary conditions here. And uh, in the solving tab, this is where we can control the simulation. Now, there's a couple of important ones here. The first big major change, really, is this thing here with the temperature. We have ambient temperature, which is the temperature of the air. And then we have a reference temperature, which is the temperature that the fl flames want to get to. At the moment, it's um, only 300 Kelvin. This is about, um, if you remember, 273 degrees um, Kelvin is zero degrees. So this is just above zero. It's about room temperature. And this is maybe double room temperature. So the fire's not that hot. If we change the fire to something like 3,000, already you can see we're remapping those hot values. And look, the flames have got a lot hotter there. If I press play now, because they're hotter, we can see they're starting to rise, which is the effect we were after. We can also multiply that rising effect the buoy by buoyancy here, because the buoyancy is what makes them rise up. But again, this is not the best place to do that. That just makes it go um, raise up a lot quicker. Let's just pop that back to one. Now, the reason I wanted to um, set it up this way was to show you, first of all, this cool node in here. But second of all, this is using what we call the sparse solver. If I go to the um, advanced tab and sparsity, you'll see it's turned on. So what is the sparse solver? How does that work? I'm just going to reduce my voxel size down a little bit. That'll make it go a bit slower. I don't have a very powerful machine, I'm afraid. And um, with all this video, overlay it's going to make it go that bit slower but if i now um, view the voxels for you by hitting wireframe what you can see here now is instead of one big box um containing all the flames we've got all these um kind of little boxes just going just appearing where the flames are as you can see there and this is what we mean by a sparse solver it still does the big container here the outside square container that we've seen, but the data that it's saving is only in these little boxes and they're only where we need them to be. All this other stuff outside here is not even calculated or stored to disk or even stored in memory. So as a result, this is a lot more memory efficient. Um, it's also it has the potential to be a little quicker. Now there's one downside with it in this version is um, we cannot use OpenCL to accelerate it. So we're limited to our CPUs. Uh, that's unfortunate for me because I have a very good GPU and not a very good CPU, so I have to live with slowness. But on most modern systems, you won't notice that much of a difference. Hopefully, that'll be something that's fixed in the future. So the downside is you can't use sparse solvers with uh, the GPU. But uh, the, the, the upside is there's a lot less memory and stuff to deal with, which is always a good thing. So if I just move forward a little bit more, you can see we get a lot of detail. So this is great for sort of rocket trails or things that have long, thin, or broken up pyro, where one big box would be overly inefficient. Um, cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Now we've seen what a sparse solver is. And the way I'm going to do that, actually, is I'm going to cut my geometry up a little bit just to make that a little faster. So I'm going to use uh, the good old-fashioned clip node here. What that will do is if I just give it along the x-axis here, it will just clip it along the X. And uh, what I might do is just cop make a copy of that and clip this one along the Z. So we just end up with a, uh, a corner of our tube there. And again, because we're flattening it and, and copying points, it doesn't matter about the volume. And look, even though for the same res, because I'm doing a quarter of it, it's going that bit quicker. So if I was doing this in production, these are the kind of tricks I would do. I'd cut it up in order to preview small bits, get it looking good. And then I'd get rid of those and let that kind of cache overnight. Because uh, when you've got deadlines, you really don't want to work slowly. So here we can get a feeling for how 
those flames are going to look and rise up. So again, let's look at some of these other features uh, briefly. So um, we looked at the uh, solving tab here. You'll see it does actually have um, use OpenCL, but you can't turn that on because it um, will fail. So it gives you an error. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with sparsity. You'd have to turn off sparse solving instead. There we go. So turn off the sparse solving and I get a different result. But at least the OpenCL works. And you'll see it is a little bit quicker here. So just for this example, so I've got some speed. I don't need the sparse solving on. I just want it to go a little bit quicker. Um, and I can show you some of these other features. So the buoyancy, as we discussed, raises it up and down. And we have built-in gravity if you want to adjust that. But if you want anything physically realistic, it's best not to adjust those. We also have cooling rate. This is how fast um, the, the, uh, f the uh, flames cool down. And as they cool down, they'll produce smoke if we have it set up for that. We'll come back to this one in a minute. Another important one is uh, this time scale. This will give us a much better, um, this kind of speeds up the simulation and makes it go faster. It's not really a, a, a speed as in time, as in the reactions go quicker and the turbulences change faster. We'll adjust that one in a sec when we just change some more things in a moment. And then I'll show you how that looks, how that works. The uh, things I want to point out first off though is this flame lifespan. That's how long the flames live for. And this is a great control for the height rather than buoyancy. Because you want the, buoy the heat to rise always at the same speed. But you can cut out the lifespan of the flames here. Let's put that to point two. And you'll see my flames don't live very long. They burn out a lot quicker. They cool down. Now we're not seeing some smoke here. Um, so let's turn, go to smoke and actually turn on some emission of smoke. Let's go back to frame one again. Now my flames are living a little bit lower. We'll see some smoke coming in. Now we might not see some, we might need to change the visualizer. We have this look tab. And in the look tab, this is how it looks in the viewport. So we can do stuff without affecting the sim. For example, I can multiply up the density. And you can see we do actually have some smoke there. Let's make it a pink or a, a browny red color so you can see it actually. Let's have, um, well, you can see it there if I make it a funky color like blue, but let's make it a darkish, blackish color, something like that. So you can adjust the uh, density of the smoke as you like. If you have too much smoke, it's going to hide the brightness of the flame, but you can increase the, de the uh, intensity scale here to brighten up your flames inside that smoke if you want to. Um, there we go, so we get our little smoke puffing off. You'll see the uh, smoke is not really hanging around very much. Uh, I don't really want to emit more smoke to do that. The reason it's not hanging around very much is um, in this shape tab. So here's the traditional shaping that we would, would have seen in the other node. And we're dissipating off the um, smoke there. So if I set the dissipation to very small, that smoke won't fade off. You'll see it just stays on and doesn't disappear. And then we'll get big clouds of smoke hanging around. And it's much more dense because it's not fading off there. So we could go back to look and just sort of bring it back a bit. Something like this, maybe 1.5. So the look is we can change all that in the render without affecting the sim, which is a nice thing. So really, we're primarily concerned at this stage with the motion and the kind of shapes and details, and we can shade it to look like anything later. So as you see there, we're getting some nice smoke. So the trick to making flames look good actually is again, in, uh, not necessarily through the uh, simulation settings or even the flame settings, apart from just the height and stuff. Um, it's all in this shaping. So just like traditional pyro, this shaping is uh, controlling the velocity fields and messing with them. So one of the funnest, uh, most fun one to use for flames is actually shredding. Let's put a high value in here to see the difference. Before you saw my uh, flames look quite smooth. Now if you look, they look a much more um, broken up. A little bit more broken up. You see there's more lines in there. So what the shredding does, it squashes and stretches the velocity field. So you get little more licks of flame coming off there. Might need to go to the look and brighten up the flames a bit more so we can see. Um, ooh, where they're being shredded and stuff. See, we're getting much more of these kind of lines coming through and little bits popping off the top there. 
rather than that blobby look that we were getting um, without the shredding on there. But because we're squashing the uh, velocity field, it does make it go smaller. But look, you get these really nice licks here where the flame just shoots up and breaks off. Because we're at a fairly lowish res, it's quite hard to see. But again, I'm trying to work for speed here. Um, let's dissipate off some of that smoke a bit quicker. Uh, actually, let's not dissipate off the smoke. If you saw that the smoke was um, getting round and fluffy at the edges there, we can break that up with disturbance. The disturbance breaks up the uh, density field here, and it creates some nice noise in there. And there's our pulse length for the speed at which that noise changes. So if we put some disturbance in there, we should see um, when the density gets thinner, in fact, when it gets below this cutoff here, 0 0.05, we'll add some noise to that, to the... Um, We'll disturb or add some noise to the uh, density here. Not seeing too much because it's quite when it's quite thin. Let's put the cutoff at 0.5, and then we should see some more disturbance kicking in earlier in the smoke in the density field. Not having much of an effect there. Let's try putting up the value um, a bit higher. Oh, yeah, because I've got a massive scene scale here. Um, the block size is uh, sort of the size of the noise. Let's just put that up, and then we might see some more noise going on in there. Because remember, my scene unit's like six meters big, so now my block size is about one meter. I'm not seeing much there. Let's put the disturbance up to 15, just to make sure it's actually working. There we go, and we can see that the uh, smoke's looking much more broken up, and there's more bobbly bits going on in there. So the edges are looking more wavy and more disturbed, because we've got features of about a meter big in here now. More matching the scale that we're dealing with. You see we've broken up that nice smoke. Now, um, we can add other things like um, turbulence and other bits like that if we want to. Now, when it comes to, um, so the traditional actually DOP settings here in simulation where you can adjust the cache and the global sub steps. If you want to improve the fidelity of your sim, um, you can go to solving um, advanced and obviously you can increase the sub steps here just for that smoke. Let's see the difference again with the sparse solving and non open CL. They do have a slightly different look. It doesn't matter which one you choose, as long as you're consistent. What you don't want to do is tune a look with one of these, change it, and then question why the look's changed a bit. <laughs> so whichever method you use, um, always stick with it. So Charlotte's asked a question, is Houdini better than Maya for creating fire, or are they just both equally as good? Bifrost in Maya is the main... Aero, Aero and Bifrost in Maya are amazing. Both systems are really good. It really depends on the job you're trying to do. No one software is kind of better than the other, but they all have their pros and cons. It's, um, it's, it's always a good way to test them both out and see which one's going to work the most efficiently. And also you understand the easiest for that particular job you're doing. And also Charlotte's asking, is it easy to import your model and textures into Maya, into Houdini to apply your effect? Um, yes, actually, getting the geometry between the two is very easy. We tend to use FBX or Alembic files, and yep, swapping geometry is great. And you can even go to and from using Houdini Engine. So in Houdini, you can build digital assets, which you can run in Maya, and you can use that to get data in and out, uh, data between the two softwares quite easily. So if you look at the sparse, it looks very, very similar, but this... This version actually will be much more um, memory efficient when I come to cache this on disk. So if I look at the voxels again, I only have them being stored there. So let's just quickly talk about rendering this. Um, if I just add a uh, light, an um, let's add a distant light, or spotlight rather. Let's just pop a light in there. So instantly, when you add a light, you'll suddenly see you get much better shading in the viewport on your smoke. I haven't really got so let's have a look at that so if i go to the look i can increase the density of the smoke a lot and you can see we really get nice three-dimensional shading in the viewport there if you really want that prior classic look this is the way to do it and then we can make that a lot brighter to sing out which is okay but um and actually if we um add a camera let me just pop a camera in here 
and add a mantra node, create mantra node. Let me just drop the resolution of the mantra node down. And we go to the um, IPR here. We can see that actually it renders as per the visualizer as we saw it in the viewport. So what you see is what you get, which is good. So we'll just give that a second to uh, generate the scene here. Let me just put, press the home button. So we should, if we have a look in the scene view, that's exactly what we should see in this render view when it gets going. My computer's under heavy load to stream everything, render this nice background behind me and rent and do this image. So there we go. We can see that looks very similar to the viewport. What you see is what you get, but that's not really it. That's not the best way to shade this. It gives you a really good idea of kind of the numbers you want, but there's not that great amount of control. There's more control in a real shader. So what we can do is come down and we have this new button here, create matching material. If we click on that, this creates a material node and you'll see that's already, excuse me, connected to a pyro shader node. If we click on this little arrow, that'll take us to the shader. We're now using the shader and the shader has been copied with the same settings as the uh, visualizer. So if I render again, we'll see that it looks the same. The difference is we have a lot more control in this shader. So I'm just gonna run that up and then I'll show you some of the extra controls that we have in the shader. And again, it's very similar to the pyro shader in the previous version. So you'll see it looks the same. If you hold down shift actually and left drag, you can actually drag a region and only render that, so it make the IPR even more efficient. And look, it looks pretty much the same. We've got the temperature here. This is mapped to the same values that we were using. And we can adjust the density here, one. And you'll see that gets rid of all this, uh, pretty much the smoke. In fact, if I set it to zero, we won't have any smoke. There you go, so we can render it without the smoke. Um, let's put that to, uh, say, three. We'll come back and play with that. And look, we can tint the smoke, we can change its color. We can make it a bit brighter if I want. And we've got extra features like um, scattering here. This will allow forward and back scattering. So whether you put positive numbers in or negative numbers, that will give you the difference between forward and back scattering. That's the difference of um, when light travels through a medium, like a uh, mist made from water droplets, or so let's put a negative number in, you'll see it get brighter. Or um, like uh, dust, which, um, is heavier. So with dust, the light gets reflected backwards and overall the smoke is darker. So positive numbers will give you more dusty like effects and negative numbers is more like mists and fogs where it's water droplets that allow the light to be refracted through them. So we can control that sort of um, look here, which you can't do without the shader node. Uh, again, we've got the intensity scale so we can brighten up our um, flames here down at the bottom, the fire. And it's remapping to a physical black body shader which gives us those natural colors from yellow to red all the way through uh, and we can play with the shadow density here as well it can make the shadows look darker or lighter which makes the smoke seem more dense or less dense so a couple of the controls i want to actually show you that are different are these guys here these intensity fields so let's look at this fire intensity field first uh, actually let's look at the uh, density field first if we use a lookup ramp, this is where it's zero density and this is where it's maximum density, we can get a lot more control here. So for example, we can uh, bring this right down and only have it looking dense where it's the thickest and that will allow, allow us to see a lot more of the flame down at the base here. So Nick is asking, could you use Blender to, for fire sims to achieve the same result and control the CDD? To be honest, I've not used Blender to really know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not a great one to ask for that. And what's the difference between, Stefano is asking, what's the difference between, use, between using PyroDOP and using a Pyro SOP solver? When is it better to use the first or the second? Um, if you're doing simple stuff, it's probably best to use the, um, the uh, SOP one. But if you're doing more complicated stuff, then it's worth going into DOPS. They're basically doing the same things with the same nodes, except the SOP one has um, given you a nice, easier interface to interact with that stuff. But if you know what you're doing, you can find the same controls in both, really. So generally, if I'm doing something simple, I'll do it in SOPs. Something more complicated, I'll do it in DOPs. All depends what you want to interact things with. So look, we can make the, uh, so that made it seem quite um, misty, the smoke, only dense at the last bit. But this way around, um, if we make a shape like this, this makes it seem very heavy 
like pyroclastic dust. If you see now, it looks very thick, almost solid, because there, there's a very steep drop off here, very quick drop off. So that's how you might want to get sort of um, volcano type smoky th stuff. So for this smoke, I kind of want to look like this. It's kind of thin, thin only we can only really see it where it's the th where it's um really the most dense so now we should be able to pull out some of those lines that are going up through it we can see it raising up there we go it's kind of the fluffy look i'm after and then there's this cool one the intensity field so with the intensity field um again this is controlling the brightness here this ramp so this is where um it's zero brightness where it's basically turned to smoke and this is where it's the hottest so the trick with pyro really is to get some good noise shapes in there and some good resolution and then hopefully I've got enough and then to take the top of this graph and pull it down like this. So make that a bit bigger so you can see what I've done. I've made it almost, this is almost at the end, but there's one more point is pulling the hottest parts to zero. And what you can see is, look, it's made the hottest parts transparent down here and it's added a lot more detail to your pyro. Unfortunately, I haven't got that much detail to begin with, <laughs> so it's not going to look that great annoyingly um, but this is this is kind of a good secret to it um, you can control that by increasing the source range here this will make these holes close up a bit more so let's just wait for that to update there we go and then bringing that back down again we can sort of open up those holes and see more detail going on in the flames but you need quite a good um, simulation with um, some good noise and resolution to start with to really see a benefit from that. Let me go back to the beginning here. So let's see how we can see some lines in detail in there. If I just get rid of this last point so that there's no clipping of the hottest parts of the flame. Because that's how real flames work. They're so hot we can't see them. And then when they cool down, they come back into the visible part of the spectrum. And then uh, we see them again. There we go. See, that's pulling out those, those high bits. Just need to bring this range back back into range. Cool. So these are the extra bits that you don't get in that. Um, let me stop that for a minute. In the look out of this node here, even though it pretty much much gives you what you see in the viewport, you've got more control if you actually build a shader, and you can do that easily with this create matching material button. So just a quick recap, it's pretty much set up in the same way as a traditional pyro sim, except we're using a burn model instead of fuel, and there is no fuel here. And again, if you're using fuel, you'll probably want to go into a proper dop sim. And um, the only difference is um, we've got all the controls up here. They're pretty similar. Um, if you like this interface and these controls, then use this by all means. Um, and if you're only really colliding, oh yeah, to plug, let me show you how it's easiest to make a collider quickly. So if we make a, uh, a box geometry here, let's just preview that. Let me just make sure it's over my flame so it collides with it. So I'll have it over half the flame like this. So unlike normal dots, what you don't want to do is um, use a surface. That'll do. So we collide with volumes when it comes to pyro. If we look at the first tab here in setup, it says collisions, and it's using collision source. This is kind of a clue. That's the node you're going to want to use. So make a collision source node, and this will create the cor this will make the correct correct volumes for your pyro sim. And again, this also applies for the um, other dot technique as well. This outputs actually the geometry here, if it was animated, and also a volume. What you can do is simply merge both these inputs like this, and then you plug them into this collisions tab. If you've got more than one um, collider, you can just simply plug more of the, merge more of these together, and you plug them all in here, volumes for collision. And uh, the collision source means it's, it's expecting both inputs from the collision source node. And this is kind of the, re the resolution of your, um, Oh, collision surface. Let's maybe put that to 0.05. So if I just, all I have to do now is simply press play. In fact, let me make these flames last a bit longer and just up the resolution a little better. So if I just go to uh, solving. In fact, let's turn sparsity off. So advanced, let's turn sparse off. Let's turn that back on. 
Let's drop the resolution down so it's a bit quicker. Yep, that'll do. Oh, that's right, I was gonna make the flame height. So let them live maybe for one, so they live a lot longer. Then we'll get a nice render out. So already as we've increased the resolution, you'll see there's more fidelity from the noises here. It looks much more detailed. And you'll see instantly it's just colliding with this object. And that can be animated. You know, the collision source can run in there. And you can cache out this merge node if it, this was heavy to calculate and then run that in later. So there we go. You can see it's nicely colliding with, um, colliding with the uh, box there. So this is very easy and quick to set up. As you can see. So um, let's just mess with the look once more. Now I've got a shader, as you can see, the look has, bears no resemblance to the render. So whatever I do here, I may, may have to do with the render again. So look, again, we've got the flame intensity ramp here. We can have a preview of cutting that noise in, but it doesn't look very good in the viewport. Let's have a look at that in the render again. Let me just render, get through the camera. Ooh. So uh, let's go to the render view, let's hit render. Let's go to the shader. Here's my pyro shader. We we'll just have to wait for that to kick in. So while we're waiting for that, Terry's asked, is Houdini better for rendering than Maya? Um, neither of them really render actually. We're using Mantra in Houdini, we use Arnold, in Maya, we could use Arnold in Houdini. You know, it's um, it's up to the renderer really. And again, that's to the requirements that you, you would want to use. So look there, we can see all this nice detail now in our flame from this, where I've set this ramp to zero. Let me get rid of that endpoint again. Ooh. And now you'll see it without that. So look, without the um, zeros there. Oh, what's going on? Have I actually got the material? No, I haven't got the material node turned on. There we go. Must have that node turned on so the shader works. There we go. Now it's kicking in. That's why the changes on the shader didn't happen. So Nick's also asking, what hardware would you recommend for a Houdini workstation? How many cores? Um, I've actually got a, a six-year-old HP 400, which isn't that fast. And I've got um, a, GTX, a GTX 1060. So it's about a 200-pound GPU. And um, I've got 16 gig, uh, no, 24 gig of RAM. And uh, as you can see, it's not that slow, Houdini. And that's more than enough. So yeah, you could spend thousands on the latest workstation or you could buy a secondhand one that's a couple of years old and more than happily do. As long as you've got a reasonable GPU and a decent amount of RAM, it's more than um, copable with. So yeah, you don't need that much hardware, fortunately. <laughs> so look, now if I put the zero at the, uh, the uh, flame here, You can see we're getting those details back in again. So I can tune this. And we can do um, a couple of other little tweaks here and then I'll take more questions at the end because we're running out of time a bit. So I just want to point out these last two settings here, adap adaption and burn. The burn helps you clip or make brighter the, ho the hottest parts. So if I put a burn in there, you'll see the brightest areas, which are these ridges, just about where it goes transparent, will be. And those, that will make those brighter. If you look in this region, see it just lightens up all of those. So you can do that a bit more subtly. And this adds more contrast to your flame to make it look more flamey. And then the adaption, it does the other end. This does the reds. So the reds is the other end of the uh, black body colors because the black body colors go from red to yellow. So look, that's making the reds brighter, which I don't like. I like to clip those down. You could almost get rid of that with 0 0.01. Oh, no, we need, a, we need a bit of adaption. But that's muting the reds down. And you can make it hotter by slightly increasing maybe the temperature here. This will just make it overall a bit brighter. So that's the trick to adding this uh, kind of holes and detail without blob um, and not getting that blobby look. So let's have a bit more density in our smoke there. So let's have really heavy pyroclastic smoke for one last change in look. 
This is what's nice. You can render, change all sorts of looks once you've got the animation working. So a really heavy pyroclastic smoke on there, and we can hardly see it peeking through because the smoke's so dense. So we can always up the uh, intensity scale so we can see those flames are really hot inside that smoke. I mean, you could go crazy and put big numbers in there. Get some very hot looks. But again, you know, you're completely art directing this. You'd obviously look at a reference and match what you see in the reference. But the point is, you know, you've got all that control here, you know, to match that reference as much as you want. It's entirely up to you. So the important thing is with any pyro sim is just to get the animation and speed right first and not worry about the look. And then as you can see, we can shade it to make it look nice later. So that thinnish smoke over quite hot. Let's just up the, the height of that. So quite thinnish smoke over quite hot flames. Cool, I think I'll leave it um, there. Hopefully you've enjoyed this little quick tips of Houdini Pyro and it's inspired you to go and dig it out and play with some of these settings. Um, so someone else is asking, Mia's asking, how easy is the transition from Maya to Houdini, would you say? Um, it depends. Houdini is a very different way of approaching 3D because of the procedural paradigm. But there's a lot of tutorials out there and learning paths. And of course, we teach a wonderful course in how to learn Houdini, which will quick start you. The advantage of having a, a structured course is you get structured learning, so you'll learn the right things faster. But obviously, if you learn on your own, you've got to decide your own learning path, and that sometimes can be confusing. Can you add microsolvers? Ah, right, good question. Yes, someone more technical there. About adding microsolvers, no, that's really easy. If you want to change the, the look of these things, let me, uh, let me get rid of this collider. And then let me uh, just oh, increase the resolution a bit. So it goes a bit quicker. Let's talk about microsolvers very, very quickly. So yeah, you can add microsolvers. All you need to do is go inside, and this is basically where you add your gas microsolvers. So let, let's just add a, uh, a gas wind one just for some fun. So this will add some wind in the, we want to go across in the X direction here. We'll leave it at 0.5. The only thing is you've got to make sure this time scale matches with the other time scale. But already we can see our smoke is blowing off to the right here with our little micro solver in there. Give us a nice interesting, interesting look at the flames. And then yeah, you can add, uh, if you add a merge node, as always, you can add in any other, if you type gas, any of these micro solvers. So let's do a, a, a disturb. So we'll add another disturb at a much higher frequency. So I'm gonna make this block based so I can put in a big frequency of maybe two, two meters. Have a, five thi uh, a thing of five, and let's have some turbulence as well, just to mess it up. So we'll have some gas turbulence thrown in. The only thing to remember about these gas microsolvers is they work, they do the maths in the order that they're plugged into the merge. So this will happen first, then we'll apply this, then we'll apply that. Might be best if I put my um, wind at the end, maybe. So I just disturb it all and then blow it, blow it, blow it all. So let's maybe up, uh, have a lot of turbulence. <laughs> So now if I press play, we've got a lot of wind and a lot of turbulence, and that's just going to look like a mush, probably. It's the problem. You add too many noises and stuff, it all gets all mushy. So yeah, let's get rid of the uh, disturb. The disturb. And uh, we'll just leave some turbulence on with the wind. Whoa, the turbulence is way too much. So look, if you pin this icon here, I mean, you don't need to pin it, really. You can still go inside. So let's bring down the, uh, let's set the turbulence off and then we can see the effect of it. So it's kind of just drifting over the wind. So if we put a turbulence of one in, have a big swirl size of two meters. So we've got big swirly wind. So we're getting some swirls now in our wind. So as you can see, it's very, very easy to add these micro solvers. So Joseph is uh, saying, what tutorials do I recommend on YouTube? Um, any tutorial that kind of makes sense, it's very difficult to say really. Um, 
good people to look at is uh, the best place to look really is the side effects website you know their own tutorials are the best ones to learn because they they obviously know what they're talking about you know if you've got um joe blogs he might not know so you've got to get an, someone that that knows on youtube the danger with youtube is you don't know which ones uh, are sensible and which ones aren't especially as a new new beginner so side effects are, it would be the place to go um how would i learn houdini on the undergraduate course um, we teach houdini on that as part of the specialism you can do that as your specialism so i teach the undergraduates a little bit houdini i think in the second year when you start to do your specialism and then you get a lot of support and you can do all your projects with that moving forwards so yep there's a lot of support for that so right one last question actually someone's asked how do we render the um render passes actually for nuke if you go to the uh, shader here You'll see we've got these two, smoke mask and fire mask. They're being output by the shader. And actually on the mantra node, or it depends on your renderer, you can add extra image planes down here. So I can add my um, two masks. What was the other one? Was it fire? I can't remember what it said, actually. So if we look here, look, there's my smoke mask. And there's my fire mask. Was it fire mask? Fire underscore mask. Oh, yeah, because we're not dealing with fire, we're dealing with flame. Maybe I have to call it flame mask. But um, you can see it's very easy just to add an, um, an, an AOV, in, a custom AOV like this in Houdini, as long as you give it the right name. So will that work with flame? Yes, it's flame, because remember, it's called flame in here, not, not um, the other one. Oh, no, that's not working. That's no, not called flame, is it? It's called um, fire or burn. So there's the fire mask. Oh, look, interesting. Oh, no, there it is, empty. Let's try burn. Let's go switch back, burn mask. Now that's empty. So, yeah, in, I think with the this node, you're only going to get out the smoke mask. Although that doesn't look like the smoke mask to me. I've not actually tested that with this version, but with the tradition, with normal Houdini, that's how you do it. You just create the AOVs with the right names. But uh, that was working a minute ago. All right. Does that help? Does that answer that question? Cool. Yeah, you're welcome, Ilara. <laughs> Excellent. All right, then, peoples. I'm going to go back to um, carry on with my friend Darth in the, in the remnants here. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you all again soon.